So the next speaker is uh, Deborah Mesh. So she is a professor of neurology. Um, she's the founder of DemarX. Um, she is the um, uh, founder of the Brain Bank here in Miami. And um, she is uh, well known for her work in addiction, uh, in particular Ibogaine, um, for which she also received an, an IND. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Stefan. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm uh, really enjoying the, the talks that I've heard thus far. Um, I'm coming at this uh, from a, a little different angle in that, as uh, Stefan mentioned, I'm uh, really curious about uh, development of novel medications for the treatment of addiction, an area that has been widely neglected by big pharma, of course, and at the same time, um, using postmortem human brain and the challenges of postmortem human brain being applied to identifying targets that are are druggable and that can bring about true efficacy for modifying diseases of the central nervous system and i uh, would like to give some uh, credit also to my collaborators before i get going here which are our group here in miami at the center for computational sciences who did the data analytics for us and uh, informed us on uh, the discovery science and then also our collaborators from the Broad Institute who were, uh, I, we were, Miami was, uh, is the GTEx brain biorepository. So uh, early on I uh, initiated a collaboration uh, with the group at the Broad and we're very grateful to them. So cocaine dependence, um, is an area where we know that there are neuronal adaptations that occur in vulnerable individuals, albeit the, uh, the risk genes and the, the genetic profile is not well defined. And one of the other longstanding observations is that cocaine remodels the brain. The brain on the cocaine is not a normal brain. That's not a surprise to anyone in this room, but when you begin to look at the data and you look at the tissue post-mortem from human subjects who are chronic cocaine abusers, you realize that there's this extraordinary plasticity and metaplasticity in neural circuits that are likely mediating this intractable cycle of drug dependency. And more recently, uh, my collaborator Eric Nessler and others have pointed to the importance of epigenetic factors that are mediating stable expression and that this may be underlying the enduring adaptations and that's why the cycle of addiction is so very very difficult to break and and why we think of it as a chronic relapsing disorder so when people in government say just say no change your behavior you can get off drugs no not really Miami has many uh, dubious honors, and one of them uh, is that Miami was at the front end loading of the cocaine epidemic. Because of our close proximity to Central uh, America and South America, the transshipment uh, through the Bahamian Corridor made, meant that a lot of cocaine hit the streets of Miami-Dade. Um, if you think uh, that the opioid epidemic right now is staggering, and it is, um, cocaine use in the United States is still quite significant. Um, just uh, last year alone, the Coast Guard seized um, more than 5.6 billion. So, and the numbers are still increasing. So, bottom line is that it's a big industry. It's a multi-billion-dollar industry, and unfortunately for us as Americans, we continue to drive the consumption, use, and sale of drugs. So in Miami, uh, we forged a collaboration. We had an opportunistic sampling of individuals who died from drug intoxication due to the effects of cocaine alone or cocaine in combination with ethanol. And in working with medical examiners, we developed a biorepository of specimens that were very well characterized and phenotyped, looking not only at blood and brain ratios of cocaine and cocaine exposures, but also collecting information from next of kin on uh, the severity of drug use and the, uh, the number of years and uh, examples like that. We also looked at the tissue in terms of the neuropathology, which is um, these brains were free of any neuropathology. So, and they're from young individuals. 
we designed a study where, um, funded by the uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, where we took two brain regions, the caudate, which is part of the dorsal striatum, and the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is kind of, you can think of it like drug, sex, and rock and roll, because all drugs that are abused by humans will lead to uh, elevation in the neurotransmitter dopamine in the, neuro, the nucleus accumbens. So the nucleus accumbens is where we think is a convergence of the reward signaling in brain. But the caudate, the dorsal caudate, is very, very important for the compulsive behavior. And there are very elegant studies done by Barrage and others um, who have demonstrated that in rodent models, if you take animals that self-administer cocaine at very high rates, you'll see a shift from um, the acquisition and the elevation of dopamine in the ventral part of the striatum, as they become persistent in their use, it will shift to the dorsal striatum. And so that gave us a clue, which is why we uh, started to work on both of those brain regions. So I'm going to talk to you only about the RNA-seq data from the caudate today. So what we did is we ran it uh, through this pipeline, looking at gene-level analysis and transcript-level analysis and um, to identify both the DE genes and the transcripts. And the cohort um, demographics are shown here for, for our subjects. Um, again, I think someone this morning mentioned about the challenge with looking at postmortem brain, but I would like to make a plug to say that postmortem brain uh, can be used with great success um, as long as you do the QC parameters and you try to filter out noisy specimens at the, at the front end. And here you can see our cohorts are very, our unaffected controls and our cocaine dependence cohorts are matched. Uh, notice that we are, are only running males in this first group of 25-25, and um, the, ra the race breakdown is shown there as well. So we didn't do the females in this study, and I know that that's politically incorrect, but there was a rationale for um, this first approach, especially because, uh, remember, women are less likely to become addicted to drugs than men, and also um, uh, m women, when they do become addicted to drugs, tend to have a much higher comorbidity with other neuropsychiatric disorders. So we tried to um, stratify here going in. You can see the RIN values are very high for the, for the brain samples. And, um, and then the, the, uh, we also have blood and brain levels. So when I show you the cocaine and the benzoyl echinine, which is the, metaboli uh, the metabolite of cocaine, what I'm trying to show you here is that we are looking at the, extreme, the extremes. So these are very severe cocaine-dependent patients who are in their active phase of addiction at the time that they come to brain autopsy. The data shown here um, are illustrating the volcano plot in A, and um, you can see the heat maps for the, D, the DE genes in A on the, on the right, and uh, the transcripts in panel B. Uh, there were approximately 331 upregulated genes in the dorsal caudate and about 124 downregulated genes. And you see that we get good separation on the heat maps. Here shows the visualization and the PCA analysis of gene expression from the two pipelines. And again, focus just now, please, on the caudate data in panels A and C. And this approach allows us quickly to identify outliers, which can be removed from the analysis. But overall, again, um, we see very good separation using postmortem brain tissues. So, when these data went in, what did we learn? And um, here, here's where it gets to the fun part. So the enrichment analysis ranked for the top 10 gene, uh, the top 10 pathways um, pointed us to some interesting observations. The, the first pathway here is, uh, involves molecular motors. And this, of course, is important for axonal transport. I'm still not wrapped my brain around why this ranks out as number one. But what was very clear from looking at these top 10 pathways was a convergence around the Wnt signaling pathway 
and the beta catenins and cadherins. And interestingly, GSK beta, which is known to be uh, a promoter of neurogenesis in the brain, and a, the GSK pathway is a double inhibitor so that when lithium, which is known to be effective and is thought to have its effect in the brain by inhibiting the GSK pathway, it's thought to be doing this through turning on neurogenesis in the brain. So this was this amazing convergence around these pathways. And uh, Sonic Hedgehog also popped up at rank number eight. And what was uh, extremely interesting here again is that sonic hedgehog is known to be turned on and to be very important for the dopamine signaling pathway in the brain and the striatal inputs uh, from the substantia nigra to both the caudate and the nucleus accumbens. And hedgehog is in, in uh, developed brain is known to be important for maintaining that dopaminergic phenotype. And to anchor all of this and, and on the biology, on the known bi with the known biology, is that number six gives us a process that's very well understood and known both from animal models to the human, which is glutamate regulation of dopamine signaling via the D1 receptor. This is a, a well-known and well-understood pathway. Glutamate's known to be involved in cocaine sensitization, and, and the reward signals are being mediated through the D1 receptor subtype. Last but not least, number 10, the uh, RAP2A signaling, what does that do? Well, RAP2 stabilizes the Wnt ligand in the membrane. It's a co-receptor. And so here that pathway also um, came up. So this gave us a clue. This gave us a clue that perhaps what was happening is that cocaine was tur turning on the birth of new neurons in the dorsal caudate. Uh, the, the neurogenic niche, which is known to be found in the human brain, but not in the rodent brain. So we've further validated some of the key genes uh, from the RNA-seq that are in the Wnt pathway using nanostring and R RT, uh, using qPCR of the RNA extracted from human postmortem brain. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, except to, to say that we did validate and um, and and. The numbers were very good. So what do we know about Wnt signaling the brain? Well, it plays a key role in neural networks, LTP and memory. We heard a little bit about that from the earlier talk. It's very important for synapse formation and synaptic maintenance. I already mentioned uh, uh, about uh, neurogenesis, regulating a, a specific network of transcription factors. It's involved in neuronal maturation and synapse formation. And now we have this transcriptome analysis in the human brain that is providing a basis for targeting, perhaps, key signaling molecules that drive neurogenesis. And then we ask the question, can we use this pathway, which is a very hot space in, the, in, in cancer biology, to begin to make some ideas about uh, where we could modify the pathway and where we might have success in, in terms of small molecules. So I'm going to go back to the rat for a minute, um, the rodent model. So I mentioned that there are differences between the rat and the human. Well, there are the subgranular zone, which is a neurogenic niche that provides new neurons. There's about 150, 100 to 150 neurons turned on every day in the rodent in this part of the brain to give you an idea of its activity, um, is also seen in the human. And this pathway is modified by neurotransmitters. Again, all of the monoamines, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, which is elevated by cocaine. All monoamines are increased by cocaine. And drug taking in animal models, we know that cocaine exerts what we think is an acute anti-proliferative effect. So when you look in the rat in the hippocampus where this niche is, it's an anti-proliferative effect. However, when you look during withdrawal states, this pool of immature neurons 
seems to be recruited and it's thought to be recruited for the acquisition and future processing of cocaine associated memories. And when you talk to humans and you say, why do you keep going out there? Even when you've been clean and sober for, you've got nine months sobriety, why are you going back out and relapsing and using what's going on? And they will tell you and you will hear it over and over again. They're chasing that memory that high, that first crack rock was so intense and so pleasurable that they want to go back and experience that feeling again. So go back in time and um, we did a study that was published with my colleague Jarlith French Mullen, who was at the time at, at a company called Gene Logic. And we were providing biospecimens for Gene Logic to, to, to put out 12 regions of the brain and from, a, from many different neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric disorders. And as part of the deal of giving them biospecimens for their studies, I said, would you run some of the cocaine brains through? So we had some microarray data on the uh, affymetric U133 uh, gene chip A and B. And got some data which are shown here, um, again, uh, using a volcano, uh, the volcano type plot is shown at the top heat maps and the PCA plot similar to the data that I've already shown you. And why am I showing you this? Well, because when we looked at this, um, we identified a lot of T-dark. I really enjoyed the keynote speaker's talk yesterday very much. Um, uh, gave me a lot, of, a, a lot of food for thought. But when we did this 10 years ago, all these genes were popping up, many of which were not annotated, but many of, the, of which were associated with this topping the list of candidate genes, REC. And we had no idea what REC was. So the, the red there are genes that were upregulated, and the blue are downregulated. And, and you see, again, long-term memory functionality, synaptic transmission around calcium, cell adhesion, synaptic remodeling, and angiogenesis. So this was a clue, but we really didn't know what to do with it. Fast forward a little bit, using an elegant paper in the rodent where they had uh, transgenic uh, animals with reporters to look at neurogenesis, pro, um, neural precursor cells and immature neurons tagged. And uh, this is a group, Fred Gage's uh, laboratory and others here. And they identified a number of genes that were previously implicated in stem cell maintenance. And who pops in? REC. Go a little bit further, we now know that REC enables cerebrovascular development by promoting the canonical WINT pathway. So things are starting to line up as we learn more. But go back now to the striatum and the dorsal caudate, because I told you that the caudate has, in the human brain, has the subventricular, so right, before, right below the ventricle in the dorsal caudate there, in the lateral ventricle, the group at the Karolinska Institute demonstrated that these, uh, this, instead of going to the olfactory bulb, in humans it comes into the caudate. And these cells express neuroblast markers, and the turnover rate, the fraction uh, within the inner neurons per year is about 2.7% in the human. And this was done using carbon-14 birth dating of human postmortem tissues. So we asked the question again, does cocaine stimulate neurogenesis? And to do this, of course, uh, we had to get out of the human brain and to get to uh, PCS cells, striatal um, stem cells, to conduct validation. And so Dr. David Lee, who joined me from the intramural program at NIDA, who's now working at the FDA, uh, set up the medium-sized spinal spiny neurons from human pluripotent stem cells in a striatal culture system. And uh, by day 45, you're starting to see the uh, expression. And by day 80, you've got the full phenotype in the neurons. And I won't spend too much time on this because I want to show you this slide. So what we did was at day 45, when you're, you're getting your committed precursors, 
we exposed them to cocaine every other day for seven days at a, at, in a concentration of three micromolar. And what you can see here um, on the, in panel B is the control looking at barred U incorporation, which is labeling up the new neurons, uh, to TUJ1, which is the, the marker, the um, marker for these cell types. And you can just see immediately without going to the right uh, that cocaine is turning this on. So we're actually seeing that cocaine is inducing premature striatal neuronal differentiation. And it was highly significant in this assay. We then went on and looked at to, to look for specific genes that were implicated in the human brain in, in the culture. And we were able to demonstrate that Wnt regulated signaling, notch regulated signaling was being upregulated in parallel with what we had seen in human brain. And the, the amount of dephosphorylated acted beta catenin was also significantly upregulated by cocaine. And I show D2, again, another anchor, um, anchor uh, dopamine D2 receptor. D2 receptor in the human brain is decreased by cocaine. That's the hypodopaminergic signaling that the reward deficiency syndrome that's been described is thought to go through D2. So even in the dish, you can actually see this. So we went back into the human brain and we said, can we, can we label these? Can we look at them? So here we're showing you the uh, LF uh, family um, members, HUCD tag neurons in the human caudate, just to give you a feeling of what the normal architecture looks like in the cocaine compared to control. And go with the next um, marker, we went with double cortin, which as I've said already, is an early neuronal marker of cells that are still proliferating, but committed to a neuronal fate. And we were able to demonstrate that there was a qualitative uh, increase and that you could see actual clusters of these immature neurons coming in to uh, the dorsal caudate. Using confocal microscopy, we took it a step further, and the DCX, as I mentioned, marks the neuroblast and, and the newborn neurons, and neuro and, of course, labels all. And if you put that together, you can see that it's overlapping. The DCX is overlapping with new neurons. So these are indeed immature and new neurons. Of course, we don't know if they form their synaptic targets. We don't know their functionality, but it's definitely that they are there. So where do you go from here? Um, there, obviously, uh, the human brain is vastly complicated. We've already heard and very exciting about the ability to get neurons and astrocytes and blood vessels on chips to begin to look at this. Um, and it's important that we need to obviously take a deconstructive approach if focusing on individual brain regions. We've already begun uh, work now, not only in the 2D model that I've already showed you, but we have uh, cerebral organoids uh, working with collaborators in Luxembourg right now where we've just started the study to begin to ask some of these same questions. But what's also interesting is that we now know that there's uh, recent papers that have come out that show that ex vivo studies demonstrate rapid neurogenesis through transcriptional activation of neurogenin or neuro D1 in human stem cells. So you can just really take the stem cells, hit them with neuro D1, and they rapidly uh, turn on to neurons. So again, this is fitting in with, with, this, with the puzzle that we're showing you here today. And we're really excited to be able to get into the organoids and to apply the transcriptomic approaches that we've already heard about here to start to understand cocaine's dynamic effects. And I just want to end on uh, this idea that um, looking at the Wnt signaling pathway and, and thinking about that there may be differences um, between the neurogenic niche and the secreted uh, proteins that are regulating parts of the Wnt pathway in the striatum from the hippocampus, that there, this may offer us an opportunity to come up with small molecules that would be modifiers of this pathway. Obviously, it's going to be a complicated thing because neurogenesis is thought to be the mechanism of action for lithium. And there's a lot of interest in CNS intractable mood or, or non-responsive de uh, major depressive disorders 
that are, are not treated by the current drugs. And everyone's depressed in our country, too, so that's a blockbuster drug that gets the attention uh, industry that gets the attention of the pharmaceutical companies, but it may be that this, by modifying and tuning up or tuning down the wind signaling pathway, that we could have um, a, a good efficacy on this target, which hasn't been thought about for the treatment of addiction. And to conclude, um, again, this is the first demonstration. I think the power of big data and the ability to work um, in groups of shared data and to have more eyes on and um, more information and great biospecimens gives us a, a terrific opportunity to lead us towards uh, new classes of molecules for the treatment of complex CNS disorders. And our, our team is very um, eager to work with Stefan and his, call, and his group there of medicinal chemists to start to converge these data sets and that is underway in our laboratories. And I thank Stefan for inviting me to present today.